All right, settle in, everybody. It's now time for talk on using WebAssembly. And um, yeah, we'll have, we're still waiting for people to settle in a little bit, but yeah. I'm going to repeat that. <laughs> It's now time for a talk on using WebAssembly and how easy it is. And uh, we'll have Brooks and Taylor talk about this. They're from Cosmonic. Yay! Alrighty. Uh, is this the thing on? Y'all can hear me? Yes. Great. Great, 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 great. Hello, everyone. Welcome to using WebAssembly now. It's easier than you think. I think we can go ahead and start off with a couple introductions before we talk about the, the agenda for this talk. I'm Brooks Townsend. I'm a lead software engineer at Cosmonic. I've been a Wasm Cloud maintainer, which is the open source side, for the last three or so years. Serial open source contributor, love writing code in Elixir, WebAssembly, and Rust. And I'm a demo enthusiast, which you'll get to see today. Yeah, there'll be plenty of demoing here. Um, I'm Taylor Thomas. I'm a director of engineering at Cosmonic. Um, I am primarily a rest station. I do a lot of rest. Got that way from go being a gopher. Um, so I have uh, just this little bit of background. I write in a bunch of different languages. I was the co-creator of Cresslet and Bindle, two different WebAssembly-related projects that are out there. Um, I'm also a serial open source maintainer and an emeritus helm maintainer. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that some more later. I have another talk later where I'll talk a little bit more about that from the Kubernetes side of things. So yeah, we're gonna go ahead and get started. It's really cozy up here. I kind of wanted to start like napping on this couch right here, but <laughs> instead we're just gonna go ahead and get started. So what's, what's the agenda of this talk? This is what we're gonna try to like achieve by the end here so you all know what's going on. So what's a WASM? We wanna answer that question first for those who, who might not be familiar. Where does it all fit in with everything? Everything. And then we're going to have a whole crap ton of demos. And then we'll say, well, what can we do now? And then we'll finish up with some how to get involved. So with that in mind, I want to ask a question before I dive into this. How many people have heard of WebAssembly? Okay, good. I'm hoping so if you're attending this talk. The second question I have is how many people here have actually used WebAssembly for something? Not just like looked at it, but like actually compiled something to it or whatever. Okay, that's, that's, this ratio is holding pretty true at all the past things I've talked to right now. It's about a third of the people who know about WebAssembly have tried doing something for real. So I'm gonna go over what exactly is WebAssembly so that we're all on the same page and then we'll go from there. So if you've been paying attention at all, you've probably heard me and several other people in the industry say this several times. WebAssembly is neither web nor is it assembly. Kind of a dumb name then I guess, but we that's, that's what it has and it became, it, kind of came from first being adopted by the web community. And the, web, the it was really appealing to the web community for a couple of reasons. Number one, it was a completely open standard. It's in the W3C, it's controlled by the standards and governing bodies there. Uh, that's something we all desire as developers nowadays. We want it controlled by not a company. Um, the next thing is that it's very safe and secure. So we. Uh, WebAssembly is all like sandboxed by default. It's very, very locked down. That's critical for a browser. Um, it has capability-driven permissions, which if you're not familiar with that model, that's exactly what happens on pretty much any modern phone nowadays. Can I use your mic? Can I use your camera? Can I? That's capability-driven permissions. And then it's very, very small and fast. So when we're talking about this being small and fast, it's it's, I mean, way, way small. You're, you're talking about really tiny binaries, and it runs at closer to native speeds, a lot closer than you're ever gonna get with something like JavaScript. It's also polyglot, meaning most languages can compile to it, um, and you can reuse existing libraries in each of those languages. And last but not least, it's portable, right? You can't have a, something that works in the browser that only works on Linux or only works on Windows or only works on Mac. You have to have something that's portable and goes across all the systems. Now, if you stop and think about it for a second, these things all right here are the exact things we want inside of cloud native applications as well, right? We want open standards. Why do so many projects in the space belong to the Linux Foundation or CNC? Same reason, people want it as a developer, we want something that's not controlled by a company. It's also very safe and secure, right? Can one of the selling points of containers was we're all completely locked down. It's very efficient and fast. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of this um, in a second, but essentially these uh, WebAssembly modules are about a tenth of the size of a, an equivalent Docker container, even if it's trimmed down doing the same thing. And it's going to be running without the overhead of a Docker runtime. 
then you also are looking at polyglot, right? We don't want to have to write or adopt specific languages to be able to, to do things. We want to be able to use the tool sets we're used to. And then last but not least, it's portable. Once again, this is where containers, we say they're portable, but they're actually not, right? You have to build a separate one for every architecture. And then Windows containers are an entirely separate beast from Linux containers. And Mac doesn't even have containers. We pretend to by shimming a VM. So WebAssembly is truly portable. I can build something on a Mac, have it run anywhere else. I can build something on a Linux machine and have it run anywhere else. That's one of the powers of WebAssembly. So good versus bad here. Okay? I, I want this to be very practical. Because, you know, What's the good stuff on the left and what's the stuff that's not so good right now on the right? And like, what is it good at? And the first thing, first thing is that it's very good at general server side computing. So we're talking about like microservices, functions as a service, those kind of things. It's very good for general server side compute. I need to calculate an interest rate if you work for a bank, or I need to calculate permission thing this, or whatever, like common stuff you see at most businesses, it's very good at. It's also very good if you need runtime optimization things. Uh, there are multiple runtimes for WebAssembly. It's not just one. This isn't like what happened where like Docker kind of steamrolled everybody unintentionally or intentionally, depending on your opinion. Um, this isn't one of those things. There are there's Wasm time, Whammer, Wasmer, Wasm three. Uh, I could keep going, and all of these runtimes are catered to different profiles, but run the same WebAssembly modules. It's also very good for constrained devices, which I'm using with big, huge air quotes, the edge, right? Like we all like to call it. So I'm talking about small devices on, on um, like in storefronts or like Raspberry Pis. I'm also talking things like cell towers and power stations and those kind of things where you can have constrained or devices that are very separated from your network. Also, uh, I think WebAssembly is very good at plugins. It has the potential to be the last plugin model to rule them all. Um, because you can write from any language, <laughs> yes, the last one, um, because it's every, every language can compile to it, it has standard formats you can call, and then you don't have to worry about this whole like defining an interop or using standard in, standard out. It's also very good at libraries, which I'll mention a little bit more here in a second. There's some things around the component model, which I'll talk about there, and it's of course very good at the browser, so think things like Photoshop or AutoCAD or those kind of things that they now have online, that's powered by WebAssembly. The difficult thing is that we have, networking is still an issue. This is becoming very close to not being an issue anymore, but it's still an issue. You want to do networking with WebAssembly, it's a little bit more difficult. We didn't get socket support until about six months ago. Roman's in the crowd, he helped do this, so six months ago-ish, right? Nine months? Anyway, so, and we didn't get it until that long ago, and, that, and it's still not fully like available and easy for everybody to use in all situations. We are also now very much in the fast moving stage. If you were here for the Kubernetes wave of innovation, we're very much in the middle where like things are changing on sometimes a weekly basis. And so that can be difficult for some people to swallow. It's also never going to be as fast as native code. Now let me just be, the flip side of this is unless you're doing, um, unless you're doing something like super performant, this doesn't matter because the the slow the performance penalty is still much better than do, than like running an, like an overhead of running at Docker, but you're still if you're talking over a network boundary, it doesn't really matter if you're optimizing for microseconds of time um, at, when you're actually running. Also, tool chains just aren't there. You're never going to have a lift and shift with WebAssembly. There's not going to be the equivalent of taking your bajillion gigabyte Java, contain, Java application and dropping it in a container and calling yourself cloud native now. You can't do that with WebAssembly. So that is a, a, an important downside. And also, there's some domains that really aren't a good fit yet. They could be in the future, but right now they definitely aren't. Think performance tuned applications, things like databases, or like, I don't mean this in a, in a derogatory way. I mean like legacy or, or well-established applications, right? Like. I, me I mentioned some of these up here. You're not going to go port Nginx or Redis or MySQL. People have done that, by the way, to WebAssembly. But you're not going to get all the performance and stuff for that right now. So that's just kind of the good versus the bad. Now, this is where we come into Wasm Cloud. Wasm Cloud is a uh, CNCF maintained um, open source project. And this is really to answer the question, like, why, why do we even have this Wasm Cloud thing? And um, I want to answer that. If Wasm's so good, why do we need something like Wasm Cloud? So this is where we get into the difference between a runtime and an application runtime. Runtimes are things, think about like Node or JavaScript versus React. 
and think about Docker versus Kubernetes, right? One is a runtime, one is an application runtime. One lets you run things at a, like a whole application at a bigger scale. And Wasm Cloud is an application runtime. But I'm actually gonna like let Brooks dig into this a little bit more about what the different components are because it matters for what we're showing you today and that promise of being able to use WebAssembly now. Yeah, so Wasm Cloud has been around since late 2019. Uh, that's when I started working on the project, just a little bit after it, it got created. And at the very base level, what we're doing is running and orchestrating WebAssembly modules. We have the goal in mind for you to be able to write full applications with WebAssembly. And for a lot of people, just like using React versus just straight up JavaScript, working with the primitives of WebAssembly, which is really numbers in, numbers out functions, and you know, instantiating an engine and a store, those are lower level than you use usually want to be when you start thinking about like a cloud native application. Think about like, you know, Kubernetes the hard way. Like that's a, it's a useful exercise, but not what you're going to do every time. We provide the secure access to application level capabilities, things like HTTP servers, key value stores, message brokers, open telemetry, those kinds of things that you expect from cloud native applications. We provide to the WebAssembly modules. Wasm Cloud also handles the scalability of your application, so being able to run multiple copies of a WebAssembly module, multiple Wasm Cloud runtimes, uh, and that's all kind of facilitated by the networking layer, which we use NATs under the hood. It's another cloud native project in the incubating tier, but we manage request routing and failover and all of that. And one of the ways, one of the reasons why we call this a, a cloud native technology is because it's built on top of so many of the great existing standards that we have today. All the WebAssembly modules and, and capabilities that we distribute, we do so uh, via the, the OCI Open Container Initiative spec. So we distribute them as artifacts, not inside containers, but just in OCI registries. We use the open application model for our declarative deployment. So you can define like an application manifest and go, hey, please go make this the reality. Same thing that you do for like a Kubernetes um, deployment. We use cloud events for all the events in our system, so they're easily, easily uh, digestible, ingestible from all of these different technologies. And that's, of course, under the hood to power our networking. And uh, as I said, open telemetry, we instrument the entire trace through the system, even though it's a wildly distributed system. So you just basically give it an OTLP exporter and we can use you know, Honeycomb, Grafana, any of those things. Now, I like going through a couple of the different core things in Wasm Cloud, just so you know when I'm talking about these applications. And the first thing is actors. These are your WebAssembly modules. You write and then compile it to WebAssembly, and you implement only business logic. All of the capabilities, all the runtime things that you access are done in terms of a common contract. So you think of like a key value store, basic operations, get, set, delete, those type of things. And the actual implementation, you choose a runtime. So your actual WebAssembly module, the application you write is completely agnostic from all of that. And there's a lot of benefits that I'll, I'll show you during the demo. They're really small. WebAssembly modules t generally tend to be around 20 kilobytes to two megabytes in size. So they're, they're really quick to distribute and then don't require a lot of runtime memory. And they're easy to develop just because you're using those common contracts. You don't bring in a lot of copy paste code from your other projects. Now these capabilities are the other side of the contract. It's the implementation for things like HTTP server or message broker. So for message broker, you may use something like Nats. We do it a lot. You may use something like Kafka where you can consume a topic and publish to that topic or produce to that topic, things like that. And because you choose the implementation at runtime, you can hot swap between those two. So if you want to connect to Kafka one day, next day you want to try out Nats, you just change that. Nothing in your application has to recompile or redeploy to do that. And that decoupled library from the business logic is really important for things like vulnerabilities, where these open source libraries that you bring into your application are now kind of managed at the platform layer instead of by every single application piece. And what we call our networking layer is the lattice, which like I had to look up the word or whatever, it's like the linked fence pattern, I don't know, whatever, you can see it. And we use NATs for this. And what this enables is a flattened topology network where cluster members can join and exit and kind of time out and then come back in later on um, just seamlessly at runtime. You don't have to deal with IP addresses, you don't have to deal with connecting to different DNS names or saying, hey, I'm gonna run three instances of Wasm Cloud. You just kind of add or remove that as you need. It's very seamlessly connected and it kind of just feels like it just works, which is really nice. And so, in general, 
where we see WASM and WASM Cloud and the whole trend of the cloud native landscape is over time we've seen this, this trend of looser coupling from the application to the platform. Essentially, the developer responsibility is getting less and less. So from where you might previously image an entire PC to run an application, we got VMs with public cloud, we went on with containers, which run like many containers, probably on top of a VM and public cloud, and so you're abstracting away the operating system, you're abstracting away the kernel, and with WebAssembly, what we see you abstracting is, is truly the entire host. The WebAssembly binary is completely platform agnostic, and it's really powerful when you're making an application that's gonna go and run in a lot of different places. Additionally, that kind of brings in the completely denied by default security model. So everything the WebAssembly module does, it has to ask the host, like, hey, can I please go access this network socket? Can I please access this file? And that's so much more powerful than having something like a container where you can add on many different layers. There's always potential to miss that, especially if it's done by a developer who doesn't really care about what happens at the end of the day. Now where Wasm Cloud comes in is just past this, abstracting libraries out into common capabilities, being able to pick that at runtime, being able to flexibly swap that out, resolve vulnerabilities kind of at the source and only one time. It's a really powerful model to build applications. And so, you know, I'll kind of show you what this looks like, but really the developer just manages their little bit of application business logic, and that's really nice. All right, enough talking. I will show you one more slide, which is just an architecture diagram, and then we'll get into some demos. So the title of this talk is Using WebAssembly Now. It's easier than you think. And if you've heard of WebAssembly, you look at some stuff on the server side, you probably see some things that look like little demo applications. I wanna talk about a few, specifically two different domains that WebAssembly is really successful with today. And the first one is like a serverless style, uh, function as a service style microservice, where you just invoke it, it does some quick data transformation or interacts with the database, and then returns some updated data. This is our key value counter demo. If you've seen Wasm Cloud before, you may have seen this before, we love this demo, because because it's very simple. The business logic is, hey, you need to accept some kind of request and then increment a counter and store that new counter and then return you know, the new value. Very serverless-y. If you break it out in the Wasm Cloud terms, you have the HTTP server capability to be able to receive requests and the key value capability to be able to interact with a persistent store of some kind. When you actually write the application, you don't actually pick what store you want. So let's take a look at some of the code really quick for this before I show the actual application. And now this KV counter, we wrote it in Rust, compiled it to WebAssembly, but even if you haven't used Rust before, it's really not difficult to, to understand the, the business logic in this code. We have one trait, which is similar to an interface or something in other languages, has one function called handle request, and this is an abstraction of an HTTP server. So you receive an HTTP request and you return an HTTP response very basic abstraction of an HTTP server. Do a little path matching to do some fancy stuff. I'll, I'll show you in a second with like getting assets, but really what we do is we match the path for a get request, and then in this function, what we do is we create a new key value sender. We're gonna send a request to a key value store, say, hey, please increment the value at this key, and then return that response as JSON. Right, it's gonna read really similar in any language, but these are abstractions. You'll notice in just a little bit of code that we have here, what we don't have is how we're gonna receive that HTTP request or how it's gonna interact with the database or do, am I gonna use TLS certificates, any of that stuff. So when we actually take a look at the application, let's see, I actually have it pulled up. Let me show you it first, it's pretty fun. This is what it looks like. I said we were doing something a little fancy, we have static assets in here too. When we click the button, we're incrementing a counter, right? We're getting fireworks, that's also fun. But the actual application is still very simple, and that is actually all powered by that code that I just showed you. When you look at the way that this is organized at runtime, we have our key value counter uh, WebAssembly module, and that has its two capabilities that are runtime linked to one HTTP server. It's written in Rust, it's running locally on my machine. It's just like a, it's, I think it's a warp HTTP server, whatever. And then the actual key value store is just a Redis server that's running on my local machine, right? This is like exactly what you would build if you were proof of concepting this like little bit of business logic. Now, it's great for writing this type of application, but what makes it really powerful when you start to use Wasm Cloud is the type of runtime flexibility you get for this app. 
So right now I have it running all on my local machine. I'm gonna actually take this and migrate it fully up to the cloud and then remove my local machine entirely from the equation. So the first step, what we wanna be able to do is have a public endpoint. You all need to be able to hit this endpoint on my local machine. You can't go on your phone and hit localhost 8082, whatever. So what we can actually do is we can draw another link and we can connect our key value counter to this publicly accessible HTTP server. It's implemented by, implemented by Cosmos. And if we access this wormhole, we can wait for a second, this is going to tunnel down to my local machine and actually hit the same WebAssembly module. And I'll actually open this really quick just while I talk. If you want to scan this on your phone, you can actually do the same thing. Send a request up to a public endpoint, tunnels down to this WebAssembly module running on my local. Really fun. Pretty sure the public endpoint's running in like US East somewhere. Yeah. And Brooks's laptop is in... Amsterdam South or wherever we're at right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so super fun. You'll be able to hit it. You'll be able to increment it. I'll be able to tell. Looks like everybody kind of got it who wanted to. Whoever hit this. Oh, yeah, a couple people, I guess, <laughs> hit it. That's pretty fun. Um, so you can actually, you're sending requests. You're storing things in my local database. Great. But we probably don't want to be running everything on my local machine, right? We want to run an instance of this in the cloud. So we can take the same WebAssembly binary that's running on uh, this MacBook, and we can run it on a cloud instance. Instance. We call this Cosmonic Manage, it's just running in AWS, and now we can launch another instance of that, and, and it's great. It'll download and run, and once we do that, we can actually see that there is, where'd it go? There's one running in Cosmonic, run, running on my local host. Everything, of course, is going to work exactly the same because we're just kind of scaling this out. And then last but not least, what we want to do is instead of storing in a local database, we store it in a cloud database. This could be your DynamoDB, your ElastiCache. Um, we have a built-in one with, with Cosmonic, which just makes it kind of easy to use. You could connect it to any key value store. Um, if you're trying to hit it right now, I did break it. I removed that link to Redis, so it's not going to work. But as soon as we relink that up with the Cosmonic key value store, we can actually go hit that endpoint. And then, of course, see a slightly different number now that we've hit a different <laughs> database. Uh, I've on this demo a couple of times before. So now, we've actually taken that application and completely moved it to the cloud. I can find my local MacBook here that's running, uh, running here in Amsterdam, and I can just terminate it entirely out of the lattice. So it's, it's gone from the network. You, I could have unplugged an Ethernet cable or whatever. And if you go hit the KV, key value counter, everything works the same, because it's gone completely from my local machine up to the cloud. So that type of runtime flexibility with the network and the capability abstraction is really powerful. It's not like you would ever do this when deploying to prod normally, but the flexibility is, is all there. So this is kind of like the, the first domain, serverless style microservice. I was able to run it on my local, do some testing, and then migrate that to prod, same logic, all works the same. Now, I want to help hang it to, or wow, hand it to Taylor for a second <laughs> to talk about, you know, we're doing some things here that are kind of Wasm Cloud specific, and let's look at what the future looks like with WebAssembly standards. Yeah. So I mentioned a little bit about libraries when I was talking earlier, and um, what I wanted to mention here, this is just a brief aside. Um, we're going to be giving some more talks on this in Cloud Native Wasm Day tomorrow, and if you're here for KubeCon, which you probably are, we're going to be at our booth. We can talk about it more in, in detail, but components is something going on in the whole WebAssembly community right now. And the idea behind components is why not just have everything defined behind an interface and then that interface can be implemented in whatever language you want it to be because WebAssembly compiles to any language. And so right now what we currently have inside of Wasm Cloud is something that looks like the left where the user managed code inc includes a library that we have to manage called Wasm Bus RPC. But in the future and we've actually already demoed it, that's what this QR code is for, we've started demoing this. Um, this is our coworker Bailey at Wasm.io a few weeks ago showing the component model in action with somebody in in, in, who is working for Microsoft, running their stuff in Azure, and then our stuff running in Cosmonic using the same code and then talking to each other. Um, this really starts to break down boundaries, but we see a future where you just write your code like you see it now, but we bring all the other components and things to do this. So we already have been thinking about components for a long time in Wasm Cloud, but we do it, we take it and we distribute it out. These things are at the code level and also make it a way easier when you're running your code because when you put your code together and actually run it, you can choose what you need at runtime for your local machine. And then we take that and make it very distributed. So this is, like I said, this is just an aside, but I wanted to note that this is where the WebAssembly community is heading, and we're really excited for it. But it, sh it shows this, this power of being able to abstract away your dependencies into something that can be represented by some sort of contract or interface. 
And then all of that, of course, is just a WebAssembly a web module. It's not Wasm Cloud specific at all. You can take it around. So I want to show uh, one other, yeah, this QR code is for, for Bailey's talk where she showed this. Feel free to grab that. Um, I want to show one more application domain that works really well for this type or for WebAssembly right now, which is a stateful microservices type of application. So the, the previous, the serverless is kind of just like a nice little function invocation. This one is actually managing a... Um, I'm actually showing a different application than this. Wow. Uh, so I'm actually going to show the, uh, the Wasm Cloud Pet Clinic, which is a little more involved. It has a couple of different services, which if you've heard of the Spring Boot Pet Clinic, um, that's actually the same example that we're showing here, the same architecture, where it's a pet clinic, uh, HTTP API, and then a couple of different microservices for uh, managing customers, vets, and, uh, and visits, so people going to the pet clinic. And so I can actually show you this application. It's the same kind of thing where it's a very simple business domain. But if we hit the, um, if we hit this, um, I can actually open up. I'll just leave it for now because we're running short on time. What we're actually doing is we're managing a couple different people in a vet system. So we have all the Cosmonic employees uh, and their pets. You know, I have my two dogs, Archie and Douglas, in here. A couple of different vets that are in the system and pet types that it can manage. So this is a like a real application that people use to show off the Java Spring Boot um, example with with microservices. And so what we have is this application. I have it running in the cloud. But then when you think about where this would ideally run, it may not be in the cloud. Ideally, you would want to run this application as close to the data and the user as possible, which would be actually in the vet clinic itself. But that brings in a whole swath of, of complications. What kind of machine am I going to be running on? Can it run Kubernetes or containers or any of that stuff? The actual Spring Boot application takes like a gig and a half of memory to run just in the jar form. So it's even more running in Docker. So what we actually have, I have this application running completely in the cloud minus the database, which is running on a Raspberry Pi at my house in DC. And I'm kind of you know, SSH'd in here so I can, I can do some things. But when we think about um, runtime optimization, if I take this endpoint and I see how long it takes to hit it from my Raspberry Pi, and we can go like grab the list of vets or something, then it takes almost half a second to go query, you know, go to this public HTTP URL, go down to the Raspberry Pi to hit the database, come back all the way around trip. It doesn't really make sense to do that. And so when we talk about runtime optimization, pushing this compute out to the edge or into the actual place where we're running the application, which is in the pet shop itself, it's really easy to do this with WebAssembly. We can do it in just a couple of steps. So I can take our HTTP API, and I can run an instance of it on the Raspberry Pi. And then I can take our VETS microservice, the thing that actually interacts with the database, and I can run an instance of that on the Raspberry Pi. There. And then, instead of going out to the public internet and hitting, hitting the publicly accessible URL, you know, what happens if the network ends up going down in the vet shop for a second, they lose access to everything? We can actually live link this to the local HTTP server that's running on that Raspberry Pi, and then say, you know, we'll hit this at localhost 8083 or something. Now, instead of going out to the network, hitting this publicly accessible URL and all those things, we can actually just go on the Raspberry Pi itself, and we can hit this, uh, this URL. So instead of going all the way out, hitting the database, it takes a long time, we can hit it locally on the Raspberry Pi, and it takes about a third of the time in order to make that, make that request. So we're constantly optimizing that to run kind of at the edge. So when we think about people who have done this, like people are getting pretty good at running cloud native apps today, right? Like they, they're pretty good at running it in the cloud, even high availability things, pushing it out to the edge, just taking it to that next domain of optimization for apps. Because the network boundary, the network cost is, is really high when it comes down to the latency of an application. So Taylor, do you want to talk about what you yeah. can do now? So this is the like, okay, we just showed you all this cool stuff, all these things you can do now, but what could you do like right now in the 
applications you have. Um, there's a couple different ways. The easiest is they're listed from easiest to hardest. One of them is to do some sort of basic data image something processing, which you can do in WebAssembly and hand back to something running in like Kubernetes. We'll show some more of that. I'll show some more of that this afternoon, actually. Uh, you can take one small part of a service that can that you want to run smaller and cheaper and rewrite it so that it can compile to WebAssembly and then run it like this. Or you could do a full stateful application if you have greenfield type things. And we can talk through more of those, but we're getting close on time. So I just wanted to uh, put up this slide. If you want to check this out and get started, we have our main landing repository that has links to everything else on the right. And we have our Wasm Cloud Slack on the left. Um, all of those are available to join and, and start the conversation with us. So with that, we're going to go ahead and, and finish the talk. And if there's a little bit of time for questions, we'll try to do some of those. We have a minute or two for questions. Nice. Yeah. Looks like couple, one in the back down over there. All right. Should we start? Yeah, go back. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, have you considered porting kind of Kubernetes webhooks or controllers or other kind of extension mechanism to this? Would it be possible to kind of, for example, in the API service, instead of going to a webhook, um, build and compiling it somehow to have, uh, some kind of Go plugin or similar, um, or writing a controller, kind of actuating a Kubernetes state based on this? So if I understand the question correctly, I think the answer would be that like it's WebAssembly is extremely flexible for this. So like if you want to compile this to a different model or hook it into a plugin thing, you could do it and you could, there's multiple points you can connect in. You could be publishing over a messaging bus. You could be, you just have to either use the contracts we have or write your own. That's something that we actually didn't mention is that each of these contracts that Brooks was showing, you're not restricted to using the ones we create. You can bring your own. So it's pretty much flexible to do any type of uh, infrastructure you want. I have to talk more specifically to you to give you a specific like examples of what you could do in that case. Then were there some question, Bruce, up here? Yeah, uh, yeah thanks. Uh, about the uh, lack of lift and shift for certain tool uh, chains, can, uh -huh. could you please just dig that, dig into that a little bit, and um, you know, how does that relate to the actual you know, pro programming languages themselves? Um, because. I, is that related directly? I mean, I'm thinking, as you mentioned, you gave the, the example of, of Python. It's not there yet, really. Mm -hmm. um, and are we seeing an evolution, or, or I guess it's going to turn out where the majority of, of WebAssembly applications will be written in Rust, primarily? And you know, when, when and how are we going to see the other languages really being able to be adopted? And yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. It's a very common question. The answer is actually pretty soon. We keep seeing like, I, it's at this rate, I've seen about a new one starting to get there every two to three weeks at this point. There's even some people experimenting with Java, which I thought would not get there for a while, at least with like the Graal VM to like make it compile to WebAssembly. And so um, the lack of lift and shift is from the fact that there are some missing things. There. I think we'll get closer to a lift and shift as WebAssembly evolves, but part of it is language support, and that's rapidly evolving. Python is almost there. Um, you have JavaScript that's almost there. JavaScript, dynamic languages here. PHP <laughs> is also there. Um, you have Rust and C and C++. You have Go just landed support. So that doesn't mean everything's there. It just means that progress is being made when you get something merged into a main tool chain. So that is where that lift and shift becomes better. I don't think people are going to be required to write in Rust to be able, in, in the long term, to be able to write things that compile to WebAssembly. I think it's quickly changing. They won't yeah. be able to because it's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of the trouble with, with lift and shift is when you take like an old Java app and you, you put it in a container, you're still able to work with the same yeah. assumptions that you had before. You still have the kernel available to you in an operating system. When you compile the WebAssembly, a lot of that changes. You have to think about everything that you're interacting with in the outside world. You can't just willy-nilly go load a config file from disk. You have to give permission to go access that. So a lot of times applications just don't work the same out of the box. That that's kind of the where we should be though right i mean the, the developers working in their application language their choice without having to worry about that mm -hmm. obviously right yeah. but but what actually real fast though what the way i understand it though rust i think c++ as well they lend themselves better 
two WASA modules because they're working at a more of a direct CPU level as far as the runtime goes? Or, or yeah, the, there's no runtime, no garbage collector, yeah. no, it, none of those. It types uses things. like an LLVM, yeah. the intermediate, so it just compiled to the WASM back end. Right. Does itself really I well. mean, but why does Rust works? It's works more on a CPU le CPU level. It's a systems level language, so yeah, it, it's a little bit closer to that that target, but it's it's definitely yeah. that's why other languages have added support and they've made it very actually very efficient in a lot of cases. So we're, we're gonna see that, we're gonna see more explosion of languages being added to that because a lot of them already did the work to do it for browser support WebAssembly. So we'll see them doing it, I think, as well for, for server side. Okay. I think was, we're at time, right? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I'm afraid. No, no, we're good. Thank you so much. Yes.